Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, sweet and high. Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. With your hosts, the incredible Jeff and the amazing D Man. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast, everybody. If you're watching this episode, we are in some brand new digs. We're in outer space now. We actually launched not only our coffee to outer space, but Jeff and I ourselves are floating in a dragon capsule as we're speaking, and we will be landing on the ISS uh, on Thursday, from what I am to understand. Is that, is that right, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk stuffed us in with a with a chimney sweeper and <laughs> oh man no uh, we 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 moved the studio I'll, I'll actually talk about that in a second here um, I just want to start off like normal um, for you guys ke- keeping track at home this is episode ninety two of the show and really excited about this show it's a good one uh, we'll it's a really good one get to that as by well. the by the way if you're just listening to this you're gonna want to watch it yes. The, this was a magical moment that we captured. Yeah, and I say it every show. Uh, if you'd like to listen to podcasts, we're everywhere podcasts can be found. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Music, iHeartRadio, all those good places. But we're also in video format. Go on over to Death Wish Coffee Company on the YouTubes over there, and you can find this show every single week as well as we put it up on Facebook too. And um, this one you're not going to want to miss. First... I am the Incredible Jeff. And I am the Amazing D-Man. And we both love Instagram. We try to social media as much as we can across all platforms, but Instagram's our one of choice, and we'd love it if you followed us. I am at Jeff Wish Coffee. And I am at Death Wish Dustin. There it is. And let's just say it, because we love him, give it up for Brock Powell. BrockVox.com. He is the voice actor on this show and a thousand other voices out in the world. Go check him out and uh, follow him on his social media because he's getting into some really crazy stuff. You said it, actually, when we went out and stayed with him for a week. I think he saw us Instagram storying, and I think a day has not went by without an Instagram story. I know. Brock. I think we influenced That's him a bit. pretty rad. <laughs> I think I, we did it. because Brock does a lot of cool stuff, and um, his Instagram stories are just non sequiturs. You know, he's not like, oh, I'm with somebody or whatever. He'll but, get into it. So he'll Pretty yeah. soon he'll find his... I feel like social media is like its own... It's, it's, it's an art form, so you do your version of that art form no matter what you do. And I think he'll find his niche as far as like what will be funny, yeah. what he'll capture. Yeah. It's, it's just a feeling out process. For and, sure. And that's why we love Instagram. And speaking of, make sure you follow at least me on Instagram this week because as this show is out, I'm going to post a behind-the-scenes video of our brand-new studio. Uh, full disclosure, what happens is is that Death Wish Coffee is growing, and um, our office space was also in the warehouse where we produce our coffee. Right. And it basically was busting at the seams with the 13 of us in the, in the office, and it's becoming very apparent that we're going to need to hire some new people. We're, we're hiring a new uh, customer service rep. We're hiring um, a couple people on supply chain. So... There was no space for these new people when we get them, so we had to move the offices. So we took all of the offices and moved them just, God, what, five miles down the road? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's not far. It's really not that far, but the podcast being part of that as well, um, we're now out of the warehouse, which is nice. You won't hear the, the forklifts in the background. Oh, but I love the forklifts <laughs> yeah. in the background. And uh, we got this brand new space. We, we switched it up a little bit, uh, uh, you know, aesthetic-wise behind us, and uh, let us know what you guys think. Hopefully... Uh, Hopefully it'll be pretty good. Secret code unlocked. Discount of death. This week and this week only until Wednesday, September 26th on deathwishcoffee.com. If you type in the secret code word, whip, Jeff, spell that. That is W-H-I-P. That will nail you 20% off of this bad boy that you see right behind me. It is this 
Stanley 25 ounce master thermos. You buy this thing once, you will have it for the rest of your life. It's usually a high ticket item, but with this 20% off, it's not such a high ticket. Get it. Get it while we have like some left. They're, they're, they're dwindling slowly and eventually there won't be any and you wouldn't have gotten one and then you'll be like, why didn't I get one? I see everybody with one and it's 10 years later and it lasted forever. 20% off, guys. I mean, like I said before, this is one of those products that you want to invest in because you're going to buy it once and it's going to last you your entire life. That's why I said I said that already, Jeff. I know, I know, and I am reiterating it. It's it's that good of a product. We were so so stoked to work with a company like Stanley to to create this. They made this bottle black. They've never done that before. Yeah, they did it for us because we're awesome and we're black. And they, <laughs> like, they they laser etched that son of yeah, a bitch. Yeah, yeah. It's it's nice, man. And if you guys have never seen this, Dustin and I put this to the test. We made sure that Stanley makes the world's strongest master bottle because we are the world's strongest coffee. And we wanted to make sure that it it could stand up to our our standards, and uh, we filmed the whole thing. And here's that here's that video, guys. The new Death Wish Coffee Stanley Thermos. Just how strong is it? Will it survive a fall? A fall from up high? How about being run over? Can it withstand? 1,500 pounds of coffee. Can it withstand a swing from the war club? The new Death Wish Coffee Stanley Thermos. Strong enough to contain the world's strongest coffee. And we still have that master bottle with us right here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it got a li- it got a little dented up, but still works though. Fully functional. Yep. Does not leak. Nothing. It's perfect. Even it's the perfect. cup. Even though the, the the cup doesn't fully fit on top, it's still a cup. It's still you can still drink out of this. thing. And you saw what we did with that thing with it, and it hit it with a cold steel war club. Yeah. There's nothing that stands up to that thing except for the Stanley Master Bottle. So can't say it enough, guys. 20% off this week and this week only, the Stanley Master Bottle. Just type in WHIP at checkout. And Jeff, why is it WHIP? Well, it's WHIP because the guest, our death guest, coming up very shortly this week is none other than Weapons Master, Anthony DeLongis. And this dude, I... I can't even. How do you even start to talk about this dude? I, I he is. There he is. He's the real deal. He's the dude who rides horses and whip whips and shoots guns and knows how to fight with every single kind of sword. Yeah. Knows every single martial art. Does every single stunt. He's been in countless movies, martial arts and otherwise. He's been a stunt man and a stunt coordinator on tons of movies. In fact, he taught Michelle Pfeiffer how to crack a whip for a Catwoman in Batman Returns, which is incredible. But one of his most famous roles on camera was fighting Jet Li. Oh, you have a picture? You have in a picture? the movie oh. Fearless. Look at it. I just watched Look this the other him. day. <laughs> Anthony is the man, and he is classically trained actor. He's a voice actor. In fact, voiced um, uh, did a voice in one of our favorite video games, Red Dead Redemption. Um, and just incredible and this is the first episode that's kicking off our months of episodes we got when we went out to LA Anthony was so gracious and invited Dustin and myself up to his ranch in the mountains outside of LA and uh, we talk about his career we talk about what it means to even be a weapons master and then he taught us how to throw weapons. Yeah, that was incredible. Uh, you seem to take to the, the hatchet pretty well. I did way better than I thought I was going you to. You did I, really good. I thought like I, he was going to show me a couple things and then be like, all right, you, I'm going to take these away from you. But uh, I, I hit the target. I, You know what? You did way better than I did, and I thought you were going to embarrass me, and it wasn't even the case. <laughs> it was, it was. I'm really impressed, Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, you did a good job. Thanks, D-Man. <laughs> you did too. We were throwing knives and hatchets. You actually took to the knives. Yeah, I think I'm going to get a... Uh, some actually after this trip, I told myself I'm gonna set up a target in my backyard. Can't wait, uh, and I'm gonna start like really honing in on my knife throwing skills. I want to actually set up time. 
to go back to Anthony's ranch. Yes. Spend a week there and become a badass. And learn how and just yes. just learn how to throw knives and shovel horse shit. Rancho and Dalo, <laughs> I'll put that up in this episode as well, obviously, because we're recording right from his ranch, but you can go. You can go and spend a day, a week with Anthony and his wife, and he'll teach you the basics, or if you're better than that, he'll teach you how to ride horses and use and guns and, and swords and stuff like that. It's crazy. And he also, him and his wife did that incredible um, tandem whip The whip tango? Yeah, the whip yeah. tango. So, so He also cool. whipped me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we've got it all on tape. It's all in this episode. Again, if you're just listening to this episode, you're really going to want to watch it. You're going to want to watch this one. Um, so much incredible stuff we got to talk with. So let's not wait any longer, yeah, yeah. guys. This week's death guest. Put those mugs way up. For Anthony Delongis. The Fueled by Death Guest. It's amazing how much uh, voices change through the microphone. Yeah. Anthony, your voice is made for the microphone. It is just like rolling smooth gravel. <laughs> it is great. Oh, I got a lot of voices. I got a lot of accents, too. Uh, <laughs> sometimes when uh, when I'm teaching... Uh, I'll, I'll, it's basically designed to. Are we rolling? I I hit record early oh, okay. on just to well, make sure it's, I it's catch everything. Is this all good? Yeah, oh, we're, yeah. it's we're basically good. designed to help people remember stuff. Because um, I love to teach because teaching keeps me performance sharp. I uh, well, I've been a professional teacher uh, just about as long as I've been it. a professional actor. I started in 1973 at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego doing Shakespeare. And good thing about that is it gave me the craft for my voice. So now yeah. later in my career, um, I'm Marshall Lee Johnson in Red Dead Redemption. I spent so Jeff much. And, uh, I spent so much time with you in that game. Like no joke. Just like, kind of whispering in your ear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure you're doing your best. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> I did my darndest. Honestly, uh, like that. That that was one of my favorite characters. Have you character. ever uh, Have you ever played Bullet Storm? No. Well, if you. Uh, if you go online, uh, I got a couple of friends. I, I had no idea. Uh, I play a character called General Serrano, who is the foulest mouth character that I've ever played. I mean, they and they strung together some stuff that I'm just going like, you really want me to say this? <laughs> All right, I'm going to commit to it. So, uh, and they kept having me back and saying, yeah, we don't know why, but people love this. So, uh, so apparently somebody put together a whole thing. If you look, uh, if you look up General Serrano uh -huh. or Bulletstorm General Serrano. There's just like a litany of you know my dialogue. So if you if you do come back on the weekend, have, have a peek at that first. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's oh my god, it's a lot of fun. And then uh, oh golly, I did uh, the Chipmunk Adventure. Uh, you know, I was Klaus, the evil di evil diamond merchant. And, and, <laughs> yeah, I like to do accents because it changes. So I do yeah. Russian and I do. Oh, I do French and, you know, a few different, uh, you know, English accents and Irish and Scot Scottish is always great fun because, you know, you can roll your arse and, and overdo it. And, you know, it may not be terribly accurate, but people like it. <laughs> yeah, you know? of course. And, uh, I don't know the Scottish guys that we've met so far. It, it seems well, like they're even embellishing a little bit. <laughs> I think the, the lassies care for it, you know. <laughs> they're, they're just trying to, you want to see what's under my kilt. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's so true. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Did you start as a stage actor then? Yes. You, yeah. Like, so straight I with started Shakespeare. doing Shakespeare. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, that was, that's, uh, that's excellent. And then um, it's very hard to make a living in L.A. Uh, in theater. Yeah. So, you know, I continue to do theater. Throughout my career, the last time, though, was probably over a decade ago. Um, well, we've been out here 15 years, and it's just... It's a pain in the neck to drive into town, you know, to, you know, for rehearsals for, yeah. you know, in the little 60 to 99 seat theaters, you know, because they, they, they still have a tendency to hire the TV stars, you know, for uh, yeah. theater plays. And there's not very many, um, uh, when I started, um, I had done Cyrano de Bergerac at the Amundsen Theater with Richard Chamberlain. Wow. And I played the Vicomte de Valvere and we did, you know, the Duel in Rhyme and I choreographed that. And that was my first big piece of uh, choreography and that got me my uh, equity card. Uh, so I went back the next year to the Old Globe. Uh, the year before I was like, you know, I was a, I was a journeyman and a spear carrier mm. changing sets and stuff. but. They read the company for the third production, which was King Lear, and I got to play Edgar in King Lear. Awesome. So two, you know, one out of every three performances, I was an actor, yeah. and then the other two, uh, I was I was in more of a supporting role, you know, which is necessary, of, of course, course. But it just was 
nice to be able to uh, sink my teeth into a part like that. So and, when did martial arts and sword fighting and all that come uh, I started, chore- well, um, college. Uh, I... I was very uncomfortable physically, you know, when I first started uh, in my career. I, you know, I started as a theater and then uh, and a history, and I sorry, as an English and a history major, and that lasted a semester. I'm like, this is what I really want to do. I really yeah. want to be doing drama and theater, and uh, <laughs> so you know, I transferred over and um, uh, I I had my hip dislocated my freshman year in college. Um, you know, at wrestling, and uh, it's not that I was any good at it, but I'd started lifting weights to my senior year in high school, so I was making changes in my body, and I was strong. I just didn't know anything. Yeah, right, <laughs> and right. So I went out, and somebody pinned my leg and body, slammed me, and popped my hip out, and they said, you're going to be a cripple your whole life. And I said, you don't tell me. I tell you what yeah. my limitations are. And fortunately, uh, you know, I was young and arrogant and invulnerable, and um, but I went, well, there goes my gymnastics career, but... I took up fencing and I liked it and um, they invited me onto the team and I went to the nationals three times and my senior year I was uh, Western intercollegiate saber champion so that was my first martial arts and then I trained with uh, maestro Ralph Faulkner um, who was the sword master to the stars he was a two-time Olympian Mm -hmm. he's he's in my living room I don't know if you noticed there's all these cold steel swords on the walls yeah Uh, and then there's maestro Faulkner you know kind of watching over everything. Wow. He was the first great teacher in my life. Um, but, uh, and then I started taking Taekwondo, and um, then I was never a great kicker. You know, I mm-hmm. did a few things. If you've ever seen Battlestar Galactica, you yeah. know, I was... The original? I was Taba, yes, been, the yeah. original, yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, back, <laughs> back before you were born, probably. Uh. Up yours very much. <laughs> and uh, but I played um, Taba, you know, with... Uh, Actually, it was very funny. It was um, uh, Fred Astaire was guest starring, and uh, so that was a big thrill to yeah. him. And you know, I was I was the, I was the young kid at the time, you know, and were these Borelian gnomon or you know desert warrior people, and right. we were going to be the new recurring villains on the show. But then, you know, after years of Cylons, uh, you know, I guess yeah, they'd been to the well once too many times, and they you know, it didn't go after that last season. But yeah. I was, I remember there was uh, me, no, I guess Roadhouse was probably my last jumping jumping sidekick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I started around that time. I started choreographing, and um, so in '73, I started doing sword choreography, and then '74 I got to do Cyrano. In '75 I did um, the Scottish play uh, Macbeth with Charlton Heston, oh, wow. which was, uh, and I ended up training him and you know performing with him at the again at the Amundsen. Uh, part of the reason I brought that up was that was back in the day when they used to mount productions. Um, the Mark Taper, I um, I choreographed a lot of action for them, you know, over over a decade or so. But they 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 stopped mounting productions and would bring in touring productions. Mm-hmm. And you know, and at that point, I'm just kind of going, I can't make a living at this. So by '75, I had gotten into SAG and uh, was starting to, you know balance and juggle all that so mm-hmm. and basically you're always looking for work anywhere you can get it um, yeah right i uh it's the taught, hustle. yeah you, you kind of have to because uh, unless you're very 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 lucky yeah and then manage to not fall on your face you know turn into something else uh yeah um most people you know it's uh <laughs> I'm 45 years into being a uh, an, an overnight discovery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, uh, I I also taught at UCLA. I taught at UCLA from '74 to '93. That was uh, that was my part time job. So I was one of the few people in the um, on the faculty who were actually working in the business, and uh, I enjoyed teaching because I was constantly telling students what I needed to remind myself, you know. And then I was also something of a liaison going. They don't really tell you this in your other classes, but here's here's what you're going to face, and here's what you can do about it. And basically, um, you know, never stop learning. Yeah. You know, be as prepared as you can. You know, take control of your time in the room as best you can. Commit to your choice, and then if you've done all that, then that's all you can do. Because ninety five percent of the time. Um, you don't get or lose a job based on your talent. It's it has nothing to do with you. That's you just don't happen to be, you know. Most of the time, they don't quite know what they want. They're waiting right. for you to tell them when you walk in, or, you know, right. It's uh, so it's 
Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I, you know, I have this parallel career. Uh, is this all right for your sound? Yeah, it, it, Jeff was saying it adds to our it's authenticity. Uh, our patois, you did yeah. you say? Yes. <laughs> no, I'm the patois. You know, but, uh, this, this, this is the atmospherics. You know, this, this is your environment. Which, by the way, when you're choreographing, is always you know the third character in any yeah. you know, in any in any combat. But I uh, it became a parallel career for me um, doing choreography and yep. um, weapons. Uh, Weapons where I liked it because um, my physical training continued, which gave me more confidence. Mm -hmm. Whether I was doing any acts or not, it just changed how I carried myself. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, I stopped worrying about what am I going to do with my hands. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> oh, never mind. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> but it uh, it gave me choices. You know, yes. and that's that's what I tell you know the people who come and train with me. I say, look, I, I applaud you for taking responsibility for your own training because you have the skills you show up with. You will, you know, there's no better place to learn things than on set, but don't think you're gonna learn something that involves high skills, you know, after you get the job. Right. You know, I, they flew me to Shanghai to partner Jet Li for a movie called Fearless. Yes, yes we're very familiar with I, that. I had to bring my A game, because yeah. uh, literally we had no rehearsal. Really? Uh, they were five days behind. The one thing I missed was I was looking forward to working with the team. Yeah. And uh, but we got there and they were five days behind. They'd run into problems with uh, one of the other characters, and they were only able to shoot him a couple moves at a time. So you know it was a matter of stay ready, be ready for you. Know, and then I met uh, I met Jet and Wu Ping when I walked on set and shook hands, and wow. the team immediately started throwing stuff together. And uh, when Jet and Wu Ping liked the looks of it. Jet and I would get up, we'd walk it once or twice slow, and then we'd shoot it at speed. Wow. Once we shot three takes. Usually wow. it was two, and then we'd do it all over again. And so neither one of us knew the choreography, um, but you know he would move, I'd adjust. I would move, he'd adjust, because we had 65 years worth of combined right. experience you yeah. know, uh, between the two of us. So uh, it, was, it was a whole lot of fun. Um, I, I realized very quickly that the one the one problem was uh, I'm playing a Western character, you know, who has a yep. Western style of fighting, and they were choreographing me as if I was Chinese. Also, the first uh, I, I had met Wu Ping very briefly on a lunch hour to show him the swords I brought, mm -hmm. and I brought aluminum. They um, they are used to working with it, which is essentially bamboo swords. They're called chambra swords, or uh -huh. um, you know, that are then covered in mylar and this and that, and they're 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 light. Um, they don't withstand a great deal of contact usually, so very often they don't. If you watch Japanese sword play, there's very little, right. you know, contact. It's, it's a lot of avoidance and right. you know, and, and preemptive cutting and stuff. Uh, but they were very sharp. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're on my wall in there. You can take a picture of them. Awesome. But um, he he said he t picked it. He picked up the aluminum that, uh, and we'd been we'd spent three months discussing this. Uh, uh, with my liaison, a fellow named Mike Leader, who uh -huh. had gone around the world casting, and originally I think it had been going to be 16 fighters, and they brought it down to four. I was one of them. Yeah. They were. They kept looking for a guy who uh, was good with a sword and good with a whip, and my name kept coming up. So huh? that was what cool. Do you know? Yeah. But it. Um, so he, anyway, he picked up the sword. He went, ah, pokey, 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 and I went, oh God, he thinks that Western swordplay is what he's seen in the movies. It's just you know, with all this, uh, exactly, right. and all this <laughs> arm pumping, and you know, which it's not. So the first three moves they gave me were pokey, 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 and I went, <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do that, but yeah. without, you know, now I, I gave them what they wanted, which were three thrusts, but I gave them a lunge and then a crossover with a twist and then a redoublement of the attack. Right. So it's the same thing, but in keeping with, you know, the martial um, practicality of the weapon and the character I was supposed to be. Um, but I very quickly realized they were having me motivate, you know, the cool things that Jet has done literally thousands of times. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the logic of the choreography was, um, it's like I'm going, well, I wouldn't do it that way, but not my, not my party, so, yeah. you know. And, uh, you know, I, I finally, I, I asked, uh, I said, I'll give you this, because I, I was attacking quadrants so that he could, you mm -hmm. know, and it was kind of funny because there were places where I had to totally commit where he was going to be even though he wasn't there yet, yeah. but then also at the same time. Because they'd had a couple other champions who had come in, and one guy who was, uh, you know, 
massive awards and champion of this yep, and champion yep. of that. Um, you know, three moves into the fight, he hit Jet in the face, you know, and almost broke his nose. Oh, and so no. there's no filming for three days, and he comes back, and two moves later, he hits Jet in the, jet in the face again. <laughs> so it was a matter of, you know, uh, we don't care, you know. We'll we'll decide you know how good you are and whether or not. Right. But I, I'd said uh, I said to Wu Ping, would you mind if I'll give you in that order? But if I get there in this manner instead of, you know this, and I guess one of the team had said, uh, who's choreographing this? Us or the Guaylo? Mm. And Wu Ping said, this Guaylo knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So after that, it was great. <laughs> yeah. But it was a it, it was really very exciting because. I, I like to evolve a piece of choreography based, you know, and do a mm -hmm. whole energy thing. And they've been working together literally for decades. So, you know, they they don't have to say much to each other and they work very, very staccato. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was just kind of going, okay, um, I, can, I can do that. It's just, um, there was never any, they didn't let me in 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 on anything. It was just like, okay, what are we doing? We're doing the okay, okay. He moved, he moved, like, gonna do this. All right, yeah. Well, and there's some pictures on the wall in there that look like they're posed. We never pose for pictures. They were always done at full speed, and they just so the the execution of structure and technique, um, you know, make makes the pictures look good right. when, when you stop them. Do you think that the style that this was choreographed made it? Because it, it seems like a real fight when you're watching it. I'm a big fan of the movie. And I think maybe some of that came across because it's, it seemed like well, you were adapting like Jet it was a real fight. Jet said to me, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we chose you because, you know, of, of your skills and your years of experience and this and that. We were looking, you know, we were looking for somebody special, which is very nice of him to say. Um, it, was, it was also funny because I was supposed to be kind of a bad guy, if you noticed. Yeah. That, you know, those... Those Caucasians, those yeah. Occidentals, oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. evil. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. that. Uh, so um, at some point, I was supposed to pull out, you know, a second weapon, the whip. Yeah. And uh, after we had, actually, in two half days of filming, I caught him up three days of the that they were, of the five they were wow. behind. So that was kind of cool. But they said to me, uh, you know, I said to Jet, yeah, well, if I'm going to pull out the second, you because know, we've shot our first day and we're. You know, into the yeah. uh, into the the second, and I'm going. If I'm going to pull out that second weapon, sh shouldn't we figure something out? Yeah, knowing there wouldn't be any rehearsal anyway. But right. you know, that that's why you train, yeah. so that you know, rehearsal is a luxury that you get less and less of these days. But you know, he said to me, "Oh, didn't they tell you? No, no, you're uh, you know, you're you're like a hero, you know. And at the end, we're going to exchange weapons." which was a scene we shot it wasn't i understand it's in one of the uh yeah the, that's in the, the extended right? i don't think i've seen that yeah i have oh have I'm you almost sure I, I, have. I would love to see that <laughs> I, I, maybe it's my uh, memory making because stuff i up, have still pictures of our doing well and that was it because it was just this you know because uh at the end when he does that disarm that was the one time they used my weapon you know in a way that you know this makes sense because i have this you know uh that's why i love a saber it has a hand shield yep um and and they they were giving me this arm guard and i said well don't put the arm guard on here i've got this guard put the arm guard over here also those were my boots and those were my Spanish leggings and those were my gauntlets because <laughs> I've I've done this before. Yeah. I travel with. Did you wear those going, on other sets? Uh, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. They, the shoes were from uh, from Highlander. Oh beautiful. Uh, you know, and I'm just kind of going. I know these look good. I know I can work in these. Yeah. I'm taking these just in case. Yeah. yeah. You know. So it uh, and they and they fit my character. It's really nice. But you know, at the end when he does the disarm, yeah. and he's going to give me my weapon back. You know, I, it's all unspoken, but I just kind of go. And, you know, <laughs> and yeah, and, and we do this uh, little uh, where it's a, it's an exchange with a mutual respect, yes. you know that okay, you beat me fair and square, and you know that yeah. was and well done, and he's kind of going, you were a worthy opponent, and and so that was uh, I was disappointed when it wasn't in the in the cut of the film that I saw, yeah, but you know I know we'd done it, but it was I I had to laugh because I'm going, so if I'm going to be a bad guy, I better pull this weapon out pretty soon, right? Because <laughs> I've also been in the business long enough now. So we're cutting the fight short, are we? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, No, no, you're a, you're a hero. We're going to exchange weapons at the end. Oh, no one told me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. No one told me. Um, yeah. Throughout a lot of your roles, I mean, you've done, you know, roles where you get to, you know, use weapons or fight, and then obviously roles like a lot of your science fiction stuff where you don't have to do that. When you do fight, do you generally have to work with a, choreo a fight choreographer? Do you get to, have there been roles that you've gotten to choreo 
do your own choreography? Yes. Not really. Um, there have, uh, I, I come to look on this as uh, there's verbal dialogue, you know, and I started with Shakespeare, and they, it's hard to find a better author than that. Right. I played Iago twice, which you know, awesome. was, was very thrilling. Awesome. Um, so when people try to stick me in a little box, I kind of go, well, I. <laughs> <laughs> I have done this. Yeah, it's a short list. Uh, and then I look on physicality as verbal dialogue. Mm -hmm. And it should be subject to the same, you know, you have a very specific intention that you're driven to achieve. You know, the, the stakes the stakes should be just as high. Um, and it is an extension of your character. The, physica the physical world uh, is a great storytelling opportunity for an actor. Um, it's another layer of performance and... Uh, it's it's it it invests an audience in your journey on a visceral level rather than just an intellectual one. I I feel like Japanese films almost oh, yes. capture that the best. I mean, I can think of um, <laughs> the blind swordsman. Uh, what's his name? Satoichi. Satoichi, which I remember watching that being like this. <laughs> this is all physical, like facial oh, oh, acting. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. Oh, and he's very funny. Yeah, I loved uh, it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, he, as a matter of fact. It, Funny you mentioned that um, Japanese, well, Kurosawa films were what got me into choreography in the seventies. I, oh, used, really? to, I used to go hang favorite. out at. There used to be a theater in town. It's now a church, uh, which <laughs> is kind of, I suppose, uh, serendipitous. But okay. it, uh, it was the Toho La Brea. Okay. And the Toho La Brea played samurai movies, and the Kokosai played kung fu movies. Oh, cool. Um, I always kind of liked the. Now the kung fu movies. We're doing the same wire work, you know, that, you yeah, know, yeah. but by the time they got around to Crouching Tiger, they had the technology to hide the wire. So, right. you know, it, it helped with the suspension of disbelief. But uh, I always kind of preferred the samurai movies because there was this vitality and intensity and commitment. Um, you know, Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, Sanjuro. I, I show you this. Uh, it's my Seven Samurai tattoo. Aha! Yes, it is. <laughs> and this is uh, Yomoto Musashi yes. Suba. Um, I'm trying. What was his name? Kojiro. Kojiro was that his? Kojiro Sasaki. Uh, no, the uh, the name of the, his character they played. I forget, but yeah, I carried along that yeah. carried that huge, huge sword. Uh, Koj you know, Kojiro Sasaki. Yeah. I think is his name. The, uh, the, with the swallow strike. Uh, no, no, you're thinking of uh, Sasaki Kojiro. Ah, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, from uh, Inagaki Samurai One, Two, and Three. Yes. But thank you, thank you for uh, doing your homework. <laughs> but those were my inspiration. I said, this is this is how choreography should look because it. It should drive character. I'm sorry. It should drive story and articulate character, yeah. or it's not. It's not serving the project or the performer as well as it could. So, in the instances where, um, obviously, I love verbal dialogue. I also love physical dialogue. And oddly enough, later the later in my career, I did, I've done more stunt work and stunt doubling, and you know, it's kind of like. I, whereas I would prefer to be playing the role if I can't I'm kind of happy to help some a other actor make the most of their character yes yeah. you know a driven action like uh, when I trained Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman yeah yep. um, she she saw that I was trying to give her another tool for her performance and, uh, and that's all her with the whip thank you um, well she none of the other None of the other stunt girls got anywhere near her ability with the whip. Really? Oh, not a. She, was she a natural? Um, you think? Not. Mm, well, she's a very hard worker. And I she's, was about to say she's she an actor. Yeah. Uh, she really it did. Looks, I, I had it looks six like weeks she to grew, literally was it born with a whip in her hand. It changed how she moved. Yeah. yeah. It grounded her, and for working, and she was never in less than three inch heels, and occasionally yeah. she was in five inch yeah. heels. Yeah. <laughs> That's intense. Um, but uh, I mean, she had Kathy Long, five time world kickboxing champion, who did a couple of you know, Michelle did all her stuff. She did. She did her fights, but there's a couple inserts, you know, where you've got Kathy Long, you know, yep. going, okay, that one had some pepper on it, you know, and uh, <laughs> and Chris Peters was doing her, you know, high falls. Obviously, you're not going to have of course. Michelle do that. Of course. But uh, the whip work was all Michelle. Wow. And she said at the end, she says, if you weren't an actor, this wouldn't have been this successful a collaboration because um, she, <laughs> after one day where I wasn't there, she said, I want him on set whenever I'm. I'm here because I'd given her a foundation to where we could literally walk on set and create something on the spot. 
and we we did it for the ice princess sequence um yeah you know, where she's tied up in the chair yeah yeah you know, i got there a little early and uh tim burton who was talking to me by this point which was kind of cool that's mm-hmm. nice you know he says uh, i'd love to be acting for you tim but hey i'm i'm, I'm here to help so you know and I, well the first thing we shot was you know her wrapping christopher walking around the neck yeah that, that was practical oh no wow. inserts or you know none of this cutaways wow. and then it's already you know she He's running and she's going, and it's over the shoulder, and, and you see him go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a nice acting. Real. Oh, it's real. <laughs> wow. And that was the first thing we shot. Wow. Uh, and it's about 34 degrees, you know, yeah. and the whips are all wet, which makes them cranky. Yeah. It's got getting a cat wet, you know. So, yeah. ah. But uh, no, she did a great job. But he, with um, the Ice Princess, you know, Tim says, I don't think there's any whip work here, Anthony. I said, Yes, sir. And I went over and I went, sat in the corner and I watched them go through the rehearsal, and when they were done, I went over to Michelle because you know we had this kind of professional you know uh relationship where I could if I had an idea I could offer it to her yeah and I said uh you know um if you were to swing in on your whip you know and then cut her free and dump her you know whip in one hand and chair in the other says lion tamer the world over yeah you know, you know, no matter what language oh, you totally, speak totally. you know and uh and she goes tim anthony has this idea <laughs> Yeah. So so that's what she did. She yeah. swung on the rope. She cut him free. She dumped the thing. She cracked the whip. She threw the chair. The girl's trying to scramble away. She grabs the girl around oh. the waist, pulls her in for a two shot, yeah. you know, for her girl talk. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and we, like, rehearsed it twice and shot it, and we were done. Wow. We literally created it on the spot. But the other, the other things, we would walk in and look and go, okay, um, there's just too much crap on the floor, so we're going to keep everything, you know, in the vertical or the diagonal. Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd say to the, uh, you know, the, the lighting guys, I'd say, can you move that light about six inches that way? Because if you can give me 14 inches for Michelle, she can work in that. And then I'd not have to worry about it. She can focus on her performance. Like uh, in the in the penguin's lair, she's she's cracking it, you know, uh, Max Shrek. Uh, yep. Wow, uh, <laughs> Christopher Walken, and uh, and then she's keeping you know Michael Keaton at bay, and she's yep. doing you know both at the same time. Well, that was, you know, it's all Michelle. That's and uh, when we're on the roof, you know, we're doing okay. We've got to fit ourselves in between these things. And, yeah, and that that's why I like to train actors. Get give me time to give them a foundation. Yep, and then. We don't have to shoot cutaways and storyboards and all this other shit. Yeah. Can, and whenever whenever the audience can see the actor doing it, then they get to go, I, I could do that too. I, right. I could rise to the occasion. You just don't get that with CGI. No, uh, no not even like, close. As much as I admire um, Halle Berry as an actress, mm-hmm. uh, when her Catwoman, it's all CGI. Yeah. You know, yeah, and 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 there's an attitude. I mean, Gary Powell, who's coordinator on Crystal Skull, you know, I got I got Harrison ready, but um, I wasn't there on set most right. of the time. Um, and uh, was that a different experience? Because I mean, working with someone well, like Michelle, you're wait, wait, what he said was uh, when I came in to meet him because Harrison called me. Harrison hired me. Oh, okay. Which you know probably didn't go over well. <laughs> but he says, "I ah, don't. You don't have to teach him very much. I'm just going to stick a handle in his hand. We'll CGI things in." And I'm going, "No, this no! is his. This is his, his iconic character action prop. Yeah, you know, uh, like let, the let's hat let and the whip. It. It's like, come on. But like, they were also kind of stuck in an idea that they wanted everything familiar. I'm kind of going, well, we've already seen that. You know, how about if we get to do something new? But um, I didn't I didn't get to go to that party. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. But I got him ready, and it's all Harrison because there was nobody else on set yeah. who could do the whip. So and, Harrison was doing his own stuff. And that's what I was kind of getting at is, is like, because like you're, when you deal with actors like with Michelle, like you're, you're kind of starting from scratch, and she's putting the work in. But, mm-hmm. Pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. Catwoman, I got it, I got it. Yeah. Um, but with like when you're doing it with Harrison, like he's had that training with the whip. Well, already, it had been so. 19 years, so mm. he'd called me up. Says, "Says Anthony Delonges." Said, <laughs> yes. He said, "This is Harrison Ford." Well, I guess we better get you in here to you know shake the dust off. Yeah. So I said, yes, sir. And uh, you know, it was great working with him. Yeah. Um, we had we had about five weeks, you know, that we we're juggling his schedule, and uh, he wanted to work with the long whip, which was. Yeah. Um, is that more difficult? A little. Yeah. Uh, it just it's more whip that you have to keep energized. All. Yeah. I'll give you a demonstration before uh, you leave. Excellent. Excellent. Both inside a railroad track. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's what most people do with the whip. This is the standard way to use a whip, like this. And most people do this. Okay, and they make a big noise. Well, that's nice. 
That's what a whip's designed to do. What else yeah. have you got? The problem with this is, I looked at this and went, well, when the, when the whip lines up with itself, it forms a loop. In the standard method, you're pushing water uphill so it can go downhill. So if you get a loop at all, it's at the very end. Make sense? Yeah. So what I do is I turn my hand over and I form my alignment loop right away. Now the whip rolls, water rolls downhill, ah. so does the whip, you see. Now the other thing is, because my elbow forearm hand and handle are all on the railroad track, the loop is above my hand so it's outside the railroad track. So therefore, everything inside the railroad track with me, let me take that out of my pocket, everything inside the railroad track with me is going to be safe because I'm going down the railroad track. I'm going past it. Follow? No matter what figure I'm throwing, is it's going forward. Oh okay? <laughs> now you'll notice... I just got the chills. <laughs> You're fine. You're out of range. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Now, this is how far away from you I am. Okay? Yep. But if you turn your head, snap your head to the right on cue, everybody will think I hit you in the face. Uh, rather than just definite. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm doing is I'm going down the railroad track. I'm going down the railroad track vertically, or I'm going down the railroad track diagonally, or I'm going down the railroad track horizontally, or rising diagonal, which is on the forehand side, or rising vertical, right? Same thing on the backhand side. You have vertical, you have diagonal, right? You have horizontal, you have rising diagonal and rising vertical. Just here, I'm following the handle. Or I could do this. Or I could do my favorite with no feet. This one of the ones I dropped to Michelle, okay? <laughs> yeah. If I'm gonna wrap you, put your hands over your head. Me? Yes. Like. Sure, okay? If I'm gonna wrap your legs, I'm not I'm not gonna swing the whip in and hitch, because that's easy. Yep. I can hit you and then the whip will, whip will wrap around you. What I wanna do is go past you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, 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 it got you pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. See, so this is going to go past you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They're like that. All right. That's how I get girls. <laughs> so I got my wife, right, Mary? Yeah. Okay. Come here. We're going to do our uh, full whip tango. Where? I want to hit the target. I don't stand over here and go, gee, I hope this works. Okay. Mm -hmm. I put, leave your hand there. Okay. I put this on the railroad track and then I run it over with my supersonic train you notice that my rear foot is pointing where I want this to go. Yeah. Which is kind of important, because if I come up here and I want to wrap your arm, yeah. instead of hitting it, okay, what I'm doing is I'm going past it, cracking, and then enveloping. Yeah. So it goes past it, cracks, and then it envelops. Yeah. And that's from that angle, or this angle, okay, or this angle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Sometimes, you know, I've had roles like in Highlander. Mm -hmm. um, my friend Braun McCash, who was Swordmaster for the show. Yeah. Uh, terrific guy, very, very knowledgeable. And also wonderfully secure in his own knowledge. So he was so happy to have, he says, I'm so glad you're here. Now I only have to do half the fight. Oh, yeah. So basically, nice. and this is how we both love to work. Where, yeah. You know, we, we, we'd actually do this at conventions and live. He's one of the few people I will improvise with, with swords in front of people. Oh, wow. Because you can trust uh, him. Well, I can trust him. You know, 80, we, we're going to keep each other safe. Yeah, right. you're not going to get And then whacked. the other thing, you know, or cheap shot it or, yeah. Right, you know, right. Because right. you know, um, also he's an entertainer. We're there to entertain the audience. But we, we do a thing where, uh, you know, okay, you have this weapon, I have this weapon, who attacks first? Well, I'm the bad guy, so I do. And it's like, well, I could do this counter or I could do this counter. You know, and we'd ask the audience, it's like, you, you, be, you be the fight choreographer. So they'd say B. So he'd atta I'd attack, he would, you know, this, and then he would counter me, and then he would, I would say, well, I could do this or I could do this, which will be, and they go A or B, A. You know, and then we go back and forth and we'd evolve a piece of choreography. And uh, what's nice with Braun is he also comes from a theater background and um, and so in theater, there is no back to one. You right. have to make it work. There is no, um, you're telling a story with the physicality and yeah. you want to tell something that's very satisfying. And both of us have a tendency to kind of, we like about a five phrase structure. 
mm-hmm. you know, where you, you you get to see the ability of the uh, of the uh, combatants. Mm-hmm. You get to see that they're very evenly matched. You get to see the hero, you know, start to and have to manage to struggle. Well, you want to root for him, right? Have, exactly. Get up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but at the same time, you don't want it to be a kung fu movie where. You know, he gets run over with seven trucks, and yes. then somehow, and somehow he still to gets get back up. up. Yeah, yeah. You just kind of go, no. I just said, okay, let's <laughs> let's have believable amount of punishment, yeah, yeah. but but also um, many's the time, you know, because I, I was choreographing for the Old Globe, and I was choreographing for the Amits, and I was choreographing for the Taper, and I choreographed for LA Opera for twenty years. Uh, wow. From Eighty-five to uh, two thousand five. Um, wow. And yeah, it was I thought that was a hoot. Um, bad. It must have been world class voices. But most of the artists hadn't had a conversation with their body in a while. Yeah. But I would win their trust, and we would all, and I'd always push the envelope. That always let me re-choreograph whatever show was coming because most most uh, opera singers, you know, have roles that they specialize in. Right. You know, it's like, you know, I I think I did I think I did five Carmens, three of them with Placido Domingo. Oh wow. And we did we did La Fentula del West, which is the Girl of the Golden West, which is yes. the original spaghetti western. Yes. 1911, you yes. know, uh, and he was uh, uh, Dick Johnson, you know, the 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 bandit who's in disguise. And, and <laughs> we had we had live horses on stage. Oh my we gosh. had uh, a huge saloon fight, you know, with two you know two stories and <sighs> guys and crashing tables and yeah you gotta crash and, through the railing uh, onto uh-huh. the table right that's, uh, that's well, a kinda. Uh, well actually I had him caught because it was uh-huh. it was easier to control yeah but um, we did all that and uh, oh there was there was a section where um, uh, it had been an Italian director and he was trying to remount something but he got disinvited because uh, he was Italian you know he has, he has a temper and <laughs> I think he threw a bottle at somebody in a different production you know and he just kind of says yeah we won't be inviting you <laughs> so he had his assistant you know his uh, his assistant come and he, there's a section go well you know, can you you know do do a lasso and I mm-hmm. said well yeah I can do that but I'm really good with a whip uh, and so there's this one section where, you know, one of the bandits that we've captured who reveals that, you know, Dick Johnson is that, uh, there's a section where he sprints for basically the orchestra pit and I reach out and I wrap him around the neck with, uh, with the whip yeah. and grab him. And I'd worked with this guy before. Um, so he trusted me cause you know, you're going around the, the vocal cords yeah, of an yeah, opera singer. Yeah. He says, no, no, it'll be good. Yeah. This, those would be great. You know, kind of going. Yeah, well, okay, put your hand up there when I, as, I, as I throw the whip. But we do that live every night. And there was a section where they said, uh, could you do a whip crack here? You know, And I said, well, I could go, Whitch, or I go, crack, 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 crack. And they went, yeah, do that one. Yeah. So, so every Fancy night, one. you know, I'm uh, I'm perched on the edge of this wagon as you know Placido Domingo's on his knees and you know and I'm cracking this whip and Placido I've worked with a bunch of times too. So, he's moving, I'm standing and straddling a wagon wheel, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm up so I can't adjust. You know, I have a place that I can right. put this, and he keeps moving closer and closer and closer. I'm going. Blasi <laughs> dope. I, I appreciate your trust, but uh, you're not making this any easier. Yeah. But for every night at that point in the in the opera, the the whole orchestra would stop while I supplied the timpani. Oh, and that's pick up so again. cool. So that was really cool. That's really cool. And, uh, so I, I have some wonderful memories from doing that. But to, to get back to your question you asked so long ago, um, I love it when I get the chance to come in, like uh, Braun and I, we worked season three on uh, Blackmail, and then in season five, I came back to do Duende, which is the mysterious circle. It was the first time it had ever been done on yeah. film, and we did that together. And then Adrian would step in and, uh, you know, perform what Braun had been doing. Right. And Adrian did a terrific job. Uh, was you know, he good? Both times. He was. Uh, I he, mean, he had to be. He had so much. Well, that went on for twelve seasons. He, 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 <laughs> well, not, no, seven. But he um, was six really, and then the seventh season, they were sort of looking to. Uh, branch out and it became the raven with elizabeth grayson right. but you know wow. he would he I would totally do 22 fights in a season yeah wow. so of course he got better yeah but um to adrian's credit he uh he would train himself in the off season wow um so you know with having braun to you know, help him with choreography and the fact that you know he's getting constant practice most of the time he's carrying the people he's fighting because they haven't taken responsibility right. for their own trip. Yeah, and they're coming in. For and then one in the off season, he would yeah. Yeah, he would keep uh, he would keep he would keep training. He must so have a real passion. So by the time I saw him in, well, and he reaped the rewards of it. He actually is now touring, uh, kind of all over the country, all over the world with his sword experience. Really? Where he's you know inviting Excellent. people to come and 
you know, um, have the experience of, you know, working with a sword. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, he's, he's, he's getting a chance to continue on and, uh, and share this with people, too, and, and the fans are loving it. Um, but with, uh, uh, you know, with season three, he was really good. Season five, he was really, really good. And, uh, and we, most people think that, you know, our fight in the rain with rapier and dagger, because he put down the katana to go back to the weapon that I had taught him when I was his sword. Right, master. right. So remember that. That, that yeah. was also a departure. And it, it, it's on my, uh, it's on my uh, sword master reel online. Delongis.com, D-E-L-O-N-G-I-S.com. <laughs> Put it right here. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, yeah, it, and, it, and it was great. And it was another case where we <laughs> we got to rehearse. the. We had three fights. We got to rehearse the first fight because the camera truck broke down and we had half an hour to rehearse. And then the next one was one uh, where we were indoors in the school. And um, uh, we really didn't, we kind of made that up as we were going along, um, you know, based on the stuff that we'd done in, you know, in the choreography of the three fights. Uh, and then in the uh, third fight, you know, the big finale, um, where we were again on the circle and we had Braun had said to them, uh, please coat this because it, it, indoors it was really slippery. He had yeah. actually had thrown some coke on the, on the floor because when it dries it gets kind of sticky. Yeah. Try to give us a little bit of, uh, you know, traction. Yeah. And uh, so we, get, we arrive at the location and it's raining. And we went, well, did you coat the thing? Well, we were going to, but it started to rain. We are like, uh. So it was like being on an ice skating rink. And if you've ever seen some of the behind the scenes stuff, there's, and I was doing a lot of twisting and torquing. Yeah. Because, you know, I was, I was wanting to get that erect Spanish defiance, you know. Yep. Yeah. And then, you know, the, um, uh, you know, and that confidence of the bullfighter and then the quick staccato rhythms of a flamenco dancer and lots of twisting and torquing and working on the angles. So there's one where I twisted and my feet just went out. Oh. I'm, I'm literally horizontal. And it's like I'm going, okay, ditch, ditch the weapon so yeah. I don't kill Adrian. <laughs> and, and, and I disappear from camera and you see water sploosh and it's just like, well, that's the comedic shot, isn't it? <laughs> that, was, that was a behind the scenes. Oh, but wow. uh, so... Uh, then, then Braun and I did a, a, a Gillian Horvath, who was one of the uh, writers on, on Highlander. She uh, became a showrunner on a show called MythQuest. And she mm. said, I have two guys. It was a Lancelot uh, you know, episode, so I was Lancelot, and he was Maleager. And we got to uh, choreograph, and then we got to perform it ourselves. That's also on my reel. But uh, it's double broadsword versus broadsword and axe. Oh. Was in that. And that was fun. Yeah, that's... <laughs> wow. uh, but then, and then there are the times where if I'm not playing the role and they ask me to come in and choreograph, you know, I will choreograph, again, the best story that I can yeah. with, within the limitations of the skill of, you know, the performer, which, and usually you get little or no time to train. Yeah. And that's when you start doubling. Um, you know, where you have somebody that can execute the story of the choreography and the longer you can work, you know, the, the performer into the shot, um, the better. Right. Sometimes all it is is a couple of close-ups as they go yep. here like this. Yeah. And sometimes like um, Atomic Blonde uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Charlize Theron. Yep. Uh, Charlize, she was a ballet dancer, you know, so she has the training, she has the physicality and she had the desire uh, and they discovered that, oh, oh my goodness, we can do prolonged sequences with the actress, yeah. which of course, again, gets the, the emotional uh, investment of the audience when they see the actor doing it. Yeah. Yes. You know, it gives them that, you know, I could do that too. It's, it's one of the things that, uh, you know, I told Harrison that um, I, think, I, I think he does every man, the ordinary man in an extraordinary situation Kind of better than anybody else. If totally. you watch him run when he's being shot at, yeah. you know, he looks like he's swatting bees. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, totally, <laughs> and, totally. It, it's not handsome and pretty. And, right, you know, right. Uh, exactly. He doesn't look like Tom Cruise. He's like, oh, yeah. shit. You know, <laughs> yeah. Just kind of the way you probably would. With running uh, from gunfire, of yeah. course. Like, <laughs> I'm going to get stuck. I'm going to get stuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, through all of your, your weapons training, is there a weapon that you gravitate towards more? Is there one that you feel more comfortable with? Um, saber is my favorite. Saber is your favorite. Uh, well, I was a saber fencer, and uh, also I think it's it's the horseman's sword. It's the horseman's broadsword. Yeah, you know, and it's been virtually unchanged 
since 14 something on up until yeah. World War One when machine guns made it impractical. Right. Uh, it's a good it's a good hand shield, but it, <laughs> yeah. not against machine not, guns. Not against machine guns. Um, and then I've spent the last decade studying Shinkendo. I'm a second degree black belt instructor in, under Kaisotoshi Shirovada, and my sensei is Matthew Lynch. And I'll probably be doing that. I, you know, uh, my knees aren't quite as uh, buoyant as they they were yeah. 45 years yeah, ago. It, when I it happens. So I kind of go, ah, the explosive. Well, it's funny. Um, the Italian style is what we think of as modern fencing, which is very right. athletic, very explosive. Mm. The Spanish style is the the antithesis of that and it, uh, it was almost unchanged for about 300 years which is why it was very exciting when I when I did the Highlander there wasn't much information available uh, on it except other people bagging on it going ah yeah it's way too complicated and they're all esoteric you know and uh, yeah right. metaphysical you know and you're kind of going uh they didn't really change significantly for about 300 years so it had a Bef they, they they were they were some of the world's most feared duelists, but they are very much they're very much upright and they essentially walk. They don't run, you know. They right. and they they do a whole lot of subtle elusive footwork to create superior leverage, which is of course a foundational principle in all martial arts. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm I'm doing the Japanese sword, which feels uh, very right. I feel like I've come full circle full circle back to Akira Kurosawa. That's, yeah. that's incredible. How uh, how much more difficult is dual sword fighting, and how much did you study? I know Miyamoto Musashi is one of the like almost the, the founder of dual sword sword fighting. When Nito Nichi Ryu fighting with two weapons, Nito yes. Nito Ken. Um, well, it's it's wonderful. Uh, it, it gives it gives you lots it gives you lots of options. Um, uh, are you asking me how practical it is? I'm asking how difficult it is. <laughs> uh, are you right-handed? Yes. How well do you do things with your left hand? It's all right. Good. So you you do work to try and do. A, yeah. You throw I, a ball well. Uh, Can you throw a knife with your left hand? I've never tried, honestly. Uh, well, we'll have to say. We'll have to see <laughs> uh, it, it's humbling. Um, no, I I I'm very right-hand dominant, but I also very much train with both hands up. Second great teacher in my life was Dan Inosanto. I trained with him for over a decade, um, and he, between what I learned from you know Maestro Ralph Faulkner uh, in, in European Sword, um, and what I learned from Dan Inosanto, uh, particularly in terms of angles on the, on the ground and footwork, um, European Sword plays very linear, yes. at least in its final um, incarnations. What we think of as modern fencing is the evolution to rapier to small sword, uh, which is very linear. It's like the piece. That's the mm -hmm. sport Back version. Back and forth. All those weapons, exactly. Yes. Well, um, that wasn't always so. Stabby stab. Um, well, pokey pokey pokey. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's more like, you know, <laughs> you got to get through this. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to be cooperative. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> impaling yourself on your opponent's sword. Well, the idea of a sword, a sword fight is, you know, you lose, you die. Yeah. You tie, you both die. That's not terror, and that's that's how most sword fights end. Right. And then hopefully you win, and aren't horribly maimed for your whole life. Yes. So the one of the reasons I stopped doing you know competition fencing because is it became about beating the machine. You know, I touched you seven hundredths of a second faster than you touched me. Yeah, but we're both dead. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, so I was kind of going, you, well, you sort of lost the spirit of the. Uh, it's like the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. You know, the letter of the law is I be, I'm seven hundred hundredths of a second quicker than you. Yeah, but the letter of the law is I hit you and I didn't get hit. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, because right. I'm pretending this is sharp. Right. You know? Right. Um, so, yeah, there's there's that, but it. Uh, uh, working with Dan and Asanto, I also learned double weapons. Um, yes. One of the wonderful things about Filipino martial arts, most martial arts, when we think of, you know, um, uh, when you think of karate, you know, yeah. you think of kung fu mm. or whatever, they, um, you are, they teach you to use the parts of your body, you know, and they connect the parts of the body first, and then if you stick around long enough, they'll stick a weapon in your hand. And go, Which okay, is an now you have an extension. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, very good. Thank you. Um, well, and I tell people, uh, look, you know, whatever this tool is, whether it's a sword or a whip 
mm-hmm. or a club, or whatever baseball it happens bat. to be. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and, and all the things that you learn, you know, um, they I can make a I can make a weapon of opportunity out of pretty much anything, mm-hmm. you know, because I have all this structure. But you know, I tell people, look, that that sword there is an inanimate object. It is a dead thing until you pick it up. Mm-hmm. Now it's an extension of your will and your skill. Right. You know, and you may have all the will in the world, but how much skill have you cultivated along the way? The yeah. more, the better. Right. Um, when I get back to something you asked earlier, uh, the reason I keep studying is, you know, <laughs> at least one of the little mantras that helps keep me doing it is if I'm not getting better, I'm just getting older. There's only one of those things I can do anything about. Yeah. yeah. But the reason for it is whether I'm getting to do the performance or whether I'm directing or whether I'm coordinating or whether, you know, I'm training somebody else, you know, to make the most of their action opportunities to drive story and articulate their character. It should be specific. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, but knowledge is power. Knowledge is choices. And your art is in the choices you make. But when, you know, I could... It's like when you look at a Jackie Chan movie. He's mm. one of the only people that you go, okay, everybody else needs a script. Right. But, you know, uh, I, I would say, it's Jackie, I don't care. He just walked into a room and I'm right away looking going, <laughs> okay, what's he going to make a weapon out of? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. Because, uh, he, because he can. Because he can. He also, he, also, uh, he also brings a wonderful sense of humor to things. Yes. Where it's all, you know... He's not afraid to take a beating, but at the same time, it all seems to be happening by accident. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Oh, Talk about oh, physical acting, right? Oh, very much so. And uh, it was the same thing with Jet Li. Um, yes. Uh, well, they're, they're often referred to that Jackie's the Gene Kelly and uh, Jet is the Fred Astaire. Astaire yeah. You know, uh, it, it's it's not a bad, you know, comparison. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, Jackie has a, has builds a sense of humor into his work and... Uh, uh, Jet, I think, is a little more serious. Yeah, yeah. quite a bit more serious. <laughs> Kick your ass. Baby. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of seems like that. Same thing like with the whip. You know, the the whip goes 768 miles per hour. Uh, you want to have an ally, not an adversary. Most people yank and crank the whip, and they use one set of muscles, you know, the arm and shoulder. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I actually, it's one of the things I'm proudest of. Um, I created... A more efficient, more effective, more accurate, safer, and more aesthetic way of working the whip with my rolling loop. And instead of just slashing, which I can do, yeah. I actually roll and stab. Uh, so my point of accuracy is about the size of a quarter. Wow. wow. Which means I'm going to hit you with 768 miles of force. <laughs> Go ahead, cover up. I'll, I'll, I'll hit you oh, somewhere it's else. Still <laughs> yeah. yeah. So wow. it, um, I'll, I'll show you later that. Uh, but I, because I watched other people, I went, that makes no sense to me. You are working so hard, and the whip's ending up behind you, which is, of course, you know, I'd never do that with a sword. Right. With a sword and a saber, this is called a moulinet, which means um, windmill. Um, in in Spanish sword play and in uh, Filipino martial arts, um, these are called redondos or circulos. And what has to happen is. Uh, um, you're uh, oh, look, a cold steel knife. <laughs> um, if you have a rigid grip, now you can be very powerful, but it's really slow, and things right. go from the shoulder. And what's happened, I went to the British War Museum years after I'd been working on this and went, Oh, I was right, <laughs> uh, because. Uh, there's eight angles of attack. There's verticals, there's horizontals, forehand and backhand, there's descending diagonals, there's ascending diagonals. And you can cut and return on the line, or you can thrust on all these lines. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them you use a lot, some you hardly ever use. Almost the Filipinos are about the only ones who use this really odd, and that was to get on, you know, get in under armor. Right. But theoretically, there's eight angles of attack. Um, footwork wise there's forward and back which is linear there's side to side which is lateral yeah. there's build a wall and get behind it that's descending diagonal or the male triangle in uh, Filipino martial arts mm-hmm. and then there's ascending diagonal where I, I let you go where you want to go and I monitor and I move out of the way so you go past me and I have now entered and I have created superior leverage that's right. what the mysterious circle is all about right. and of course every other martial arts in the world uh, so there's eight angles it's another asterisk and circle because if i move and you move too nothing is nothing has changed right if i move and you don't now i have better leverage so that's one of the things i do when i'm teaching people is i, I give them an overview 
they say, look, one lifetime isn't enough to learn everything about any art, but the more arts you study, the more you start to find the things. What does it make this combatively viable? And every system has eight angles of attack, depending on what the tool is. If you have a tool, whether it's a stick or a sword or a piece of rebar or a, you know, a fireplace poker or a baseball bat, yep. you're going to use these one of these eight angles, probably more than one, uh, whether it's rigid or flexible. And you're going to be working angles. You know, uh, yeah. to generate power, you know, you're stepping, driving off the rear foot and torquing your hips. That gives you power, which is, again, something that's part of Filipino martial arts. Back to the redondo. Um, the idea is in order, you know, the 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 blade follows my hand. Yep. This happens with the whip. This happens because I use the whip as if it's a flexible blade. Okay. So from here, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm over here and I want to get to over here, I don't want to go backwards cut my hair and, and right, you know, right. do this right what I want to do is I want to release relax my grip change my angle and close my hand and as I do this okay my hand moves very small and I'm behind my guard you, you hear that right I'm accelerating the blade each time as I go and it's very fast okay this this uh, this is called boulonne or redondo or circle or whatever you like but you have to release your grip which means i'm always behind my elbow so i'm always in skeletal alignment uh -huh. and i'm very fast because my hand's moving small the blade is moving big does that make sense yes that doesn't work if you're doing this right it right. all reminds me of katana work where it's what do they call it stirring the air I suppose, and and then uh, the eight way cut. It all, it's all, it's oh, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's all the same. Oh yeah, well, that, and that's it. And we can start to see. Oh, well, we basically call them ribbons of truth. But you know, there, there are these foundational structural elements that connect all the arts. So anything you've studied will help inform whatever else you're studying. As long as you realize there's weapon-specific adjustments that maximize the effectiveness of that tool or reference that particular culture. Right. But what makes it work are these foundational principles. So that's why I use the whip the way I do. I, I'm relaxing my grip and I'm doing this. And when instead of, you know, hacking and chopping, right. I actually turn this over and I form a loop. Now I follow my handle. And whether whatever angle my hand is on, that's the angle of the handle. So I form the loop follow the handle this rolls out accelerating as it does until at the end of it it goes over 700 miles an hour yeah and it'll like cut you like a knife oh yeah uh people tell me that i don't fly fish but ah. uh, <laughs> uh i i bet i'll be pretty good at it <laughs> I, I, bet bet you would. I bet you I would, bet you would. <laughs> um we've covered this actually uh, speaking on your mantra but it's the question that we ask every guest on our show um through your career, through everything you've learned with your teaching and your acting and your, 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 you know, the fight choreography and everything that you've done, what fuels you to keep doing it? What fuels you to, to keep wanting to, to be better, like you said? I like, I, I like to be creative and I like to cash a check. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, well, the more things you can do, the more likely, you know, uh, the more likely someone needs those skills, you know. Uh, here, I'll give you each a card. Uh, excellent, excellent. Card. excellent. It's, it's a two-sider, <laughs> and uh, and and I and I tell people if I can't do it, you probably don't need it. Don't need it. Yeah, but it, well, it's a little arrogant. But uh, of course, to me, the difference between arrogant and confidence is: can you deliver the goods? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> for sure. Um, but I, I like to stay creative, um, and being creative, part of being creative is uh, I'm always trying to learn new things and learn what I already know even better, and one of the best ways for me to do that is to teach. Yeah. Because when I teach people, excuse me, I'm, uh, I get to rediscover what I already know through mm -hmm. their eyes, uh, and I'm very often, I'll tell somebody, I've been teaching this over 30 years. I've never taught it this way before because you teach me how to teach you. Um, so it becomes very becomes very personal and very individual. I don't teach everybody the same. Right. Um, the knowledge where I'm taking you is similar, but how we get there is kind of going to be up to, A, how hard you want to work, but yeah. also what do you already know that I can tap into or, you know, and we'll go on this journey together. And if you, if you want to know, 
and I know how to do it, I'll find a way to communicate yes. the information to you. So that that helps me. And um, mostly what it's done is it's fueled me with uh, this arsenal of choices and possibilities and, and inspiration, if you will, so that you know when I'm given a chance, you know whether I'm doing verbal dialogue or physical dialogue, or I'm directing something, mm. you know, or I'm writing something. I, I just um, oh, there's a group, um, um, Wendy Jones and Liliana um, uh, Bordoni. Uh, they are writing Highlander Imagine, which is uh, they've taken you know the the Highlander series. And um, they are going, well, what if, you know, what if Tessa hadn't died, you know, and how would this affect? So they've written, uh, golly, have they written three novels now or four? Uh, I wrote ag action for them uh, on the last two. Oh, nice. Which was kind of fun. Yeah. So, I, so I'm having to take something that, you know, I would normally do visually, you know, and then paint that picture, you know, uh, on the page. Yeah. So that's fun. Um, but yeah, again, it, it, it kind of comes down to, um, <laughs> I don't like to just sit. Yeah. I get bored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear that. I hear that. Uh, and then of course, you know, um, so yeah, having, uh, the, the, the voiceover work is fun because thanks to the theater training, I don't blow out my voice. Right. Um, you know, they, if you, if you're doing video games, there's some stressful voice where, yeah, most people blow their voice out in about half an hour and yeah. I can go a four-hour session, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, and I'm kind of going. Thank God, I, you know, I developed craft. Yeah. So it's why the Brits get all the work because you know they. It's the truth. They have craft. God, it. <laughs> darn it. Yeah, that's the I have craft. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I can speak that way if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, so you're teleported in the middle of a, a battlefield, right? And everybody's fighting with weapons. Which weapon do you choose? The cloak of invisibility. <laughs> <laughs> Best answer ever. Best answer ever. Yes. Oh gosh. Um, finally, um, I just want if there's anything that you can talk about because I know that like there are projects out there that man needs a good cup of coffee that's gets the... you started in the morning. Death wish. That's that's it right there. <laughs> if you're um, gonna go for a career in show business, there's no more apt metaphor than death wish. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, is there anything um, project wise that you can talk about coming up? That, that, that you've worked on? Because I know a lot of times like there's stuff in the works that you know you can't talk about or whatever, but... Um, or at least the best way that our viewership can follow you, would it be your, your website? I think my website, okay. which is which I'll right up in the, in, in the episode. Uh, you can also find me on my IMDB page, yep. but that's only film film and television. Right, work. right. Uh, voiceover work as well. It, has, it doesn't show any of the theater work. Um, but still, it's nice to have somebody out there semi keeping track. Yeah. Every once in a while, we have to go. Mm, where, where, where's all the stuff I've done recently? Right. Uh, I, no, the the crazy thing about a career in show business is I never really know what my next job is going to be. Uh, I just I got a call two weeks ago to, uh, you know, teach Kathy Bates um, how to. Uh, I suppose I shouldn't say too much about it. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't want to get but you in trouble. How, how, much, uh, how much time did I have to teach her something, uh, you know, very high skills? 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. So, oh my goodness. you know, I mean, I saw the location and I said, okay, well, uh, she's not even going to be able to do any of this, so I'm not going to bother waste time trying to teach yeah, her that. Right. You know, and uh, but she's a terrific actress and, you know, she, she trusted me and we got the job done, but it's just kind of like going... I had six weeks to train Michelle, yeah, and then I kept training her throughout filming for the next two months too. Right, uh, you know, thirty that, minutes. So that's idea. Well, <laughs> we're constantly breaking our uh, our record for how little time can we possibly wow. have, because um, it's been a while since. Actually, I've never worked on a uh, on a feature where I had. Okay, we're going to be doing this, and we're going to rehearse for three months, and then right, we're going to go right. in here, and then we're going to do previs for a month, Never and then the we're going to, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to have, you know, ten days to shoot the, just the fight. Yeah, and I'm kind of going, oh, that must be wonderful, right? Um, <laughs> even when I when I when I did Masters of the Universe, I was playing Blade. Yeah, I got to create a character that didn't exist in the. Uh, in the He-Man universe, right. which is really which cool, is super fun. Uh, it really was. And then um, uh, 
Walter Scott was was coordinating, uh, and I, I worked for Walter a bunch of times since then. I worked for him on uh, Magnificent Seven. I worked for him on, uh, oh, golly, what else? Uh, well, the, one the of my favorite things. Must be it was one. the TV series. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and then uh, a movie I'm real, really proud of is um, Second Hand Lions with yeah. Michael Caine and Robert Duvall and yep. Haley Joe Ottman. And, wow. You know, this is what's important about being a man. And, and Michael Caine is telling the boy all of these flashback stories. And they said about, you know, when they were in the Foreign Legion and rescuing princesses and battling evil sheiks and, you know, and swords and stuff. And, and they said, uh, Walter said, they want it to look like, because uh, it's memory and it's yeah. imagination. If they want it to look like, you know, Errol Flynn and the Mark of Zorro with Tyrone Powers, he says, oh, yeah. oh, oh, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's great. But anyway, this is the first time I worked for him. And um, Lauren James is a very famous stuntman. He, uh, uh, he used to double uh, Steve McQueen. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, and uh, he was there to do the sword stuff. And, and Lauren, I'd worked with him. I did the first season of MacGyver, and uh, I played Pietro the assassin. You know, yeah, I got, mm-hmm. got to do uh, I like five that. different accents. Oh yeah, I actually I actually could pin myself to the ceiling, you know, and hang like a ninja. You know, uh, <laughs> wow. I'm kind of going, oh, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! <laughs> I'm really doing this. You know? <laughs> but uh, it, it was a really fun role, and uh, so anyway, he knew me. and He says, "You know more about this stuff than I do. You trained Dolph." So I got to train Dolph for a month, and then I didn't see him for a month. Because uh, he was busy shooting other things, right, right. And um, I kept saying to Walter, "When can I see the location? You know, so I can put together some ideas for you." Yeah. And he's going, "Ah, oh, you know, yeah, we'll, we're going to have all the time in the world. We're going to get down there. You know, we'll be there, for, be there for six weeks. You know, I'm kind of okay. So we get to location. What do you think was the first thing we shot? Well, fight scene. Really? I had about an hour. Oh, oh my man. God. So I went. Remember the stuff I taught you? Uh, yeah. Okay. And then we had to kill some some boxes that were there and then uh, he picked up Sarad the lizard man yeah. you know, and threw him at me I'm like oh great so I'm going to be a stunt pad oh good on the concrete oh my god uh, it made worse by the fact that my chain mail uh, back 30 years ago they there were, weren't a lot of people making chain mail yeah um you know in theater they would they would knit it and spray it and from uh, the distance it looked pretty good mm-hmm. but um, so Julie Weiss who's the wardrobe lady she had me all in surgical rubber that was lined, fortunately. I got her to take the arms off so I could actually breathe. But um, the chain mail was six, yes, was six 10 foot lengths of pipe cut into quarter inch pieces. So I'm probably wearing about 50 feet of pipe. Yeah. Which is heavy. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I'm running wow. around in that. But so that was, that. That's what usually happens. Right. And then we got to... Like Throne uh, of the Wolves. They, uh, they also said, because uh, you know, Walter at that point is going, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of handy to have around. Uh, you want to double Frank Langella. Right. Know? And I said, well, yeah, I trained Dolph, and Dolph trusts me, and we'll take care of each other, because he had Buick Slayer, you know. Yeah. Yep. And I'm going, okay, um, so is this before or after the transformation? Is he Skeletor in his hood with his power staff? Right. Or is he going to be whatever he's going to be, which I didn't know. Right. Yeah. But, you know, is there something I need to know about his wardrobe? And they said, no, no, it's, it's he's Skeletor. So I put together some nifty staff and sword moves, you know, where it wasn't wushu, but there was, you know, there are things where it yep. moves around your body and there are things you can do the, so you're working the angles. And, um, I guess it was, I don't know if it was the afternoon before we were going to shoot it or or, a few hours notice going, no, 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 this is after the transformation. So I basically had, you know, the Glenn Levitt Elkhorns and the New York skyline up here. So all of this stuff wasn't going to go. So I had to throw something together again in, you know, about an hour to kind of go, all right, we're going to do this now. But, and oh, made, made better by the fact uh, we had lots of smoke. Uh, we had the, we had probably the biggest set piece probably since Ben Hur uh, on these two stages over at Laird, and um, uh, they used a lot of smoke. Well, the smoke they were using makes a nice oily film on the floor, All right. which again is slippery. Yep. Yeah. And then I'm in uh, Frank Langella's boots, which fit Frank. They don't fit me. Yeah. Um, so they're too tight. They don't fit. And I always, if I'm going to have a boot, put dancer rubber on the bottom so you've got some grip. Yep. His were leather soles. Oh. So nice leather soles here oh like this. God. And then I'm in the helmet, 
which means put <laughs> here, put this here. Yep. So you know, I'm I'm looking through essentially a visor, so I have almost no peripheral vision, and you know, oh and, and the feet are all good and slippery, and I got to go downstairs. I'm going, uh, so that's. That's that's, uh, that's normal. That's the time I haven't had to you know, yeah. throw stuff together. Well, like you said, you know, that's why you put the time in to the craft that you're well, you're doing because you can then on the fly know that you trust yourself at least in that moment. You well, know? you like, can you, you can protect me because yeah. I mean, Dolph's very very good, but he's slinging something that was you know enormously heavy, <laughs> giant, <laughs> and and we just made stuff up, up, yeah, you know, and we're kind of going. I have to protect myself at all times, but at the same time protect him. And, yeah. You know, oh, it was, it was fun working with. Him. I'd love to work with him again, but uh, well. The, that was why, see, where it really came to fruition was when I worked at Jet Li. Cause yeah. It was basically, I came in with my 30 plus years. Yeah. He had his 30 plus years. Yeah. So no matter what the other person did, we were, that's why it looked so real. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because neither one of us knew the next move. Right. We would read what the other person was doing. Because and we, you know, we, we would commit to where the attack was. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I, I do a thing where I've got a full, ex I never close my hand, you know, to, to snap the blade. Yeah. That's always the last thing I do. So you've got all, you can see all this. And if I have to, I cannot. Right. Because I was not going to be the one who hit jet in the face. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, very, and like one of the first things we did, they were used to making, you know, the jins, which is the Chinese scholar sword. Yep. Uh, they weren't used to making the sabers because they were a little longer, they were a little thinner, and they were a little more flexible. And uh, in that, when we did it, when we were doing the first uh, sequence, you know, we broke a couple. Mm. Uh, we weren't hitting terribly hard, but they hadn't quite gotten the balance uh, yeah. down. And at one point, he did a thing where he was coming up and blocking, but he was throwing his hand into the back of his blade uh -huh. to essentially attack the attack yeah and the that the the edge of my you know the my blade bent and came around and slapped him like that and the whole team went, oh and he goes no no that was me i that was me because you know i i said to him when we, when we first met and shook hands i because i looked at him and went, okay we're not going to have this discussion are we he says so you know, I'm going to be cutting straight for your head. I'm going to be cutting, you know, at your yep. right at your shoulder and your chest and your hip. These are the targets I'm going to be targeting, so you'll know. And he says, "Oh, that's that's great. You know, you you're very skilled and you have a lot of experience. And you know, um, you know." He says, "Well, yeah, I'm very concerned. With, you know, I'm very interested in your safety." And he goes, "Me too." And he laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, we got along great. That's, that's excellent. Awesome. So, but it was it was. We were as close to improvising the fight as, as you can get. Wow. It's going to start here. We're going to do a bunch of stuff in the middle. I don't remember what. And then this is how this phrase ends. Okay. Wow. <laughs> See you on the ice. Wow. Incredible. It's incredible. Anthony, I can't thank you enough for sitting down and talking with us. Um, it, it, it's absolutely inspiring to hear you talk about your craft and your career. And I just, I just can't thank you enough. For well, it. thank you. Oh, uh, let, let me get in a quick plug for Rancho and Dolphin. Yes, let's do that. As I said, this, this is where my school is. Yes. Uh, people come from all over the country, all over the world, to train with us here, and I do all the European weapons, you know, um, saber and rapier and broadsword and um, double weapons, rapier and dagger and small sword, and then we do uh, the Filipino weapons. You know, we do sticks and we knives and stick and knife, and we do double sticks and double, mm -hmm. double weapons, uh, and we uh, I also do Japanese weapons uh both katana and spear and stuff and then we of course uh i teach the whip unlike anybody else in the world yeah uh then we uh, we also have archery and we have an on-site gun range and we have you know extraordinary riding opportunities and if you can ride we can take weapons up on the horseback so it's a great place to train my wife's an extraordinary chef and um you know, we, we get professionals, we get people who want to get into the business, and then we also get, uh, you know, kind of people who, you know, have always wanted to... Um, Live out their uh, dream as an action Yeah, man, right? exactly. This you know, guy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always wanted to do this, but I had responsibilities. I had to be an adult. Yeah. But no, you don't have to be an adult here. That's <laughs> so, excellent. So come out and, uh, you know, and train with us and uh, awesome. share some of this adventure. Awesome. I'll put all that info in the, sh in, in, in the, the liner notes of the show, too. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. An Excellent. honor. Excellent, sir. Awesome. Well, see, the only time we get to practice is when we perform. <laughs> see, 
You know, I've got a tool that goes 700 miles an hour, which means I don't have to. <laughs> right? I can quite casually beat you to death. Yeah, you're barely moving. Yes. What do you mean that one? Yes, that one. <laughs> Okay? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, that's the best <laughs> ever. Dr. Mary Yay! This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.